Hi, and welcome to Network AF. In this episode, I talk with my friend Elliot Noss, CEO of Two Cows, someone with a business background who came into the ISP industry and then has been for over 20 years at Two Cows, has done some revolutionary early CDN-ish work, really shook up the domain name space, started a, mer- a mobile virtual network operator, an MVNO, uh, and is now in 2020s getting into and expanding the ISP business. Uh, we'll talk about that, uh, a little bit about life and culture and companies. Um, so please join us and watch the episode. Hi, and welcome to Network AF. I'm here with my friend of a few decades, Elliot Noss, uh, CEO of Two Cows. Elliot, could you give a quick personal and professional intro? Sure. Uh, first of all, nice to see you. Uh, Good to see you. Second of all, um, you know, I've been uh, uh, at Two Cows, you know, kind of running Two Cows um, uh, for now. I'm in my 25th year. Uh, prior to that, a couple of few years in the ISP business. And uh, from my perspective, whatever happened before the first browser launched really doesn't matter. Um, you know, we've been in a number of businesses over that time. You know, you've seen them all and we'll talk about them. Uh, but, um, you know, all of that has really had me uh, kind of deeply inside of, uh, you know, the ISP space specifically, therefore the networking space in general. No, absolutely. And uh, I really applaud. It's pretty amazing doing that in in public as a public company, <laughs> um, you know, is uh, is interesting. But you've always been pretty open, you know, about, about what's going on, which I really appreciate. So, Two Cows, the name. Yes. Are you a, were the founders cow herders or? or uh, no, it was, it was a, uh, it was the ultimate collection of windsock software. Uh, it's a, uh, I like to call it an anachronistic acronym. Um, <laughs> it was actually, this isn't talked about. It's not, you know, it was originally ooh cows, but somebody was smart enough to add the two. So it brand, okay. you know, that was the original formulation kind of in the room, just mm-hmm. ultimate collection of Windsock software. And then yeah. But he smartly added it to you. Oh, interesting. And so for those, uh, youths in the audience, do not remember uh, operating systems didn't used to come with TCP IP stacks. So we actually, at my ISP, as you said, like when I started NetAccess in 1992, no one thought that everyone would have IP addresses at home. Of course, now sometimes there's not, right? But, um, you know, we gave a, a, a slip disk with Trumpet Windsock, which I think we licensed, and and Mosaic. And that was what got people on the net. And then, and of course, uh, Eudora, uh, some people called it Endora when they called up for tech support and all that. So, yep. um, we, <laughs> so. you know, we had a brisk business in uh, creating ISP starter disks. You know, oh, yeah. Selling physical ISP yeah. starter disks, you know, yeah. that we burn and send out. Yeah, no, absolutely. We did, yeah, we did it just for ourselves. Yep. So how did, you, how did you get connected with Two Cows? Uh, I was in the ISP space in Toronto. Um, in one of the very early competitors. And Two Cows, the original website was owned by an ISP. So um, the largest ISP at the time in Toronto, uh, uh, they well understood the importance of uh, uh, software downloads as a, you know, sort of a primary uh, mm-hmm. kind of need of all the very early geeks who were buying accounts from them. Uh-huh. And they, um, you know, they were just smart enough to basically buy the website from the, you know, the guy who originally put it together, who was a librarian <laughs> in the Flint, Michigan uh, right. uh, system. So, um, you know, I came in, they hired me from the ISP that I was at, and I couldn't believe that they owned this website. In fact, I said to them, oh, you know, you, you, you I see, you, you know, what is this? What is the two cows thing that you have? Like, are you the Canadian mirror? Right. And they said, no, we own it. And I couldn't believe it. Now, that may sound strange to anybody, you know, kind of outside of 95, 6, 7, 8. But, right. you know, back then, uh, that was a remarkable piece of, of internet landscape. And so they just let me build the business because nobody else was really doing anything with it. 
well, ISP nerds not always passionate about software unless you got come from the BBS days and downloading and Kermit and Xmodem and, and all. It's funny okay. because in the later mid 96, 97, I don't know if you ever ran into Andrew Koo, uh, but uh, I, I was in, he brought me to Australia and we were doing satellite bandwidth augmentation, but we called it, we jokingly, we put squid caches in and we called it the social engineering caching protocol where they would look at what objects were in the cache and email their users saying interesting content so that people could keep the traffic locally back when <laughs> back when bandwidth was somewhat more expensive than two yep. cents per megabit per second. So. Well, in Australia was, of course, a unique case. We were huge in Australia for exactly oh, yeah. the reason you, you describe. Right. I mean... You know, imagine when you were when you were downloading. You you glossed over it, but if you were Australian and you were downloading something from cheaper to FedEx a hard disk, right? It was <laughs> cheaper to FedEx a hard disk than to download anything uh, from off the general internet. So anything you could cache was huge, yeah. and, and I mean it was true really everywhere, but North America in the mm -hmm. beginning. Yeah, yeah. So, well, and the business model for that was advertising. It was advertising, yeah. We so we partnered there. We became one of the two or three biggest in the world with Download.com uh, by partnering with ISPs all over the world. It was over a thousand ISPs in over a hundred countries, kind of at peak. Um, and you know, it, it was advertising. But I mean, this is very early days of advertising. So this was inbound. You know, it started with uh, uh, all of the casinos. Uh, oh, because so they just came to you directly. You were one of oh, the yeah. top 10. They were, you know, can we advertise? And somebody was smart enough to take their money. And then that, you know, kind of evolved into all kinds of things. We probably had a performance-based marketing uh, piece with WinZip for, for, for years and years and years. I mean, so uh, if you wanted to get your trialware or shareware out there, you know, we were one of the two or three best places to advertise in the world. So Awesome. So... I was at Akamai for 10 years. And often when people are saying, talking about the first CDN, where I point out actually Sandpiper was a was a real was a real CDN. It just wasn't as, as fast as Akamai and then DigitalOcean. But I actually think of two cows as in some ways the first yeah. CDN. Do you agree, disagree? So uh, it was um that was the way it was described to me. So I didn't think about it natively like that. You're, and I've always been much smarter about networking than I am. Uh, I got the utility of caching, but I didn't see the bigger picture there. Yossi Vardy, who was an old friend because we distributed, you know, we were the original distribution point for ICQ. Uh, he oh. beat me over the head and face with that. You know, as you guys at Akamai would, um, <coughs> would, would uh, you know, we're just blowing it out uh, uh, in the public markets. You know, he was he was he was pounding me with my failures for being first, but not uh, taking advantage of it. And and I don't know if you remember, but uh, you know, I, I remember definitely uh, us meeting at ISPCon well yeah. before Akamai. You know, I still tell people now that I'm back in the ISP space. I still tell people about the original "My ISP Sucks" last T-shirt when I'm trying to. <laughs> Uh, help them, un, you know, help newcomers understand the industry. So, yes, uh, you, you'd be happy to know that that's that that history is being proper. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Elliot. I, 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 what particularly in the ISP space, the reason that I think that is still so deeply apt, and you know, we could talk about yeah. culture and companies and work, <laughs> but in in this context, is that ISPs today. Uh, the, the ISP service today, overwhelmingly, over 90% of the accounts in the U.S. are being provided by people who are not ISP people. They are not, they are telecom people or they're cable people or they're copper people. They are not ISP people. And there's just a different headspace and mode. You know, I think that the reason that dial-up ISPs independent ones dominated over telecoms is because they rightly put the customer first. And there's just this, 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 this ethos and this essence in it that just doesn't exist in the industry, except when it's all ISP people. Too disconnected from, I mean, it's interesting because if you look at the network as a service companies <clears throat> or the interconnection as a service, they are people that did interconnection management. They were more 
more recently, fewer levels of indirection, the mm-hmm. customer, which is sort of why I started Kentic, because I was like, wow, when I left Akamai, the networking sucked. I had to build my own. And people are like, oh, yeah, I mean, you know, sort of we need that. So, so to come back to networking, where I guess a little diversion, domain names. I want to thank you for Open SRS. <clears throat> and actually, I had a lot of nerd friends that were like, suddenly starting little businesses doing domain <laughs> registry <laughs> and 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 like how did that how did that happen and why why did you decide to like go for high margin high high volume low margin and not milk the market at a time of you know huge explosion yeah what um so there, there, there's there's a couple things in there uh how we came to it you know people today uh, just don't have a good sense of history where around, you know, prior to 2000, there wasn't a web hosting industry. Web hosting was provided by ISPs Mm -hmm. because there was this vibrant world of ISPs. There were kind of the nuclear events of 99, 2000, 2001, the switch from dial-up to uh, now... Vario buying everybody. Cable and DSL. No, even before people buying everybody. It was really, once it went to DSL and cable, it wasn't freely competitive anymore. There wasn't that sort of regulated, you know, dry copper you could buy or the, the just the, the, you know, the, the copper phone lines that we could all buy to plug right. into bottoms. And so uh, all of those ISPs essentially got crushed, went one of three places out of business uh, into the very corners of the world where you still see the wisps of today, mm-hmm. or they became web hosting companies because they could go to the other side of the pipe, which wasn't regulated, didn't require the same amount of capital. So all of that's to say, we were the largest uh, vendor of domain names, the largest reseller of network solutions. People also won't remember that you used to buy a domain name before the introduction of competition. That meant uh, faxing and mailing things to network solutions. So uh, as competition was coming, this is now pretty much with the millennium, January 2000 was kind of our launch. Um, You know, we knew that it was ISPs and web hosting companies that were the people who actually sold domain names. It wasn't this artificial construct called registrar. So our view was, and, you know, our view was just to facilitate all these people, just basically instantiate the business processes that we wanted, you know, as sellers of those domain names. Right. Or everybody else. So it was like, you know, that thought was really simple. And then in terms of price, you know, we just, um, we went out and we said, well, this is a commodity that is completely competitive. It's naturally going to get priced down to a very low margin. We watched people coming out. We were a little bit longer because we didn't have to just stick up a website. We were doing wholesale. So we had to, you know, set up APIs. It was a bit more complex. And, um, you know, we kept seeing co- people come out at the same $35, $35. We couldn't believe it. I mean, I remember a phone call where I'm like, you know, are we crazy or are they crazy? Right. You know, and so we came out at $10. It took six months for that price to go to eight, like for us to be undercut. Right. So, uh, <laughs> you know, and today that's obviously very, very thin margin business. So it was just kind of the, the it was just kind of looking at the market and seeing obviously where it was, ironically, you know, we, we priced it at $10, but eight if you were a two cows mirror, because right. it was still the case when we launched that that business was the bigger business. We were still three, four yeah. months away from the dot-com bust, and we were trying to feed the, you know, the other engine. So. Well, and take the ad, take the ad revenue. Yeah. 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 So, you know, that's, that's. Um, and that business is still around, you know, 20 years later, it's mm-hmm. we're the second largest in the world. We're by far the largest wholesaler. You know, it's now no longer, um, well, it's now what I would call modern uh, web hosting companies. Right. So that's Shopify and Wix, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, so you, 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 you see that version. What is amazing though, is I bet you that some chunk, some portion, 30, 40% of, you know, your friend yeah. from back then who started businesses, those businesses are still around. Oh, the yeah. half-life of internet companies is crazy. They it may is. have peaked at a thousand company customers and they might be sitting mm-hmm. on just cashing checks on 400, mm-hmm. you know, now all these years later. So we have thousands of customers who are just these, 
you know, almost, you, you know, it's al- it's almost like light from a distant star or something. Uh, but there's still millions of domain names like that kicking around. Yeah, no, it's and it's fascinating because I was going to contest, you know, the the crushing of the independent ISPs because. I know a number of people that that really they build a business, they made a couple hundred thousand a year, you know, net, and it's morphed, but they're still doing it. And it's got some hosting, some consulting, and there are people like like maybe me and my grandfather that maybe aren't as happy working for other people as they are ha- working for themselves. Uh, you know, they like making decisions and um, and you know, a lot of them are ham operators, or you yep. know, like you get a lot of. So we could talk about subtext of persona <coughs> some yeah, other time. Well, but well, so that is, you know, I said web hosting. That could be web hosting. Right. That could be IT services. <laughs> you know, that could be a whole range yeah. of technical. Well, and Wisp, as you said, which we'll <coughs> talk Wisp, about. Absolutely. Yeah. And by the way, we're you know we're going to see the the reemergence of that segment. Yeah, you know, look, that's uh, you know we're now doing it again at scale. It doesn't change. I mean, that's you know, we and need if you to have humility. Market. People but, have a lot of patience if you have humility, if you have personality, yep, if you have right. if they feel that they know the people, then they're like, okay, I could wait, you know, my Facebook can wait for a minute. Uh, but when there's not personal treatment, then people get really, really antsy. Really, I had a I had a carrier issue yesterday where I walked into the store from one store from another in a mall, and he's like, I showed him the phone and he's like, Oh, okay. I'll I'll help you out. You know, it's like I'm sorry. It's like, hey, it's not you. It's not you. There's someone. Someone in the yeah. back room made the decision. The, You're a nice, you know, nice nerd. You you protested earlier uh, about being removed from it. I think you can take the boy out of the ISP, but you can't take <laughs> the ISP out of the boy. You know, you're still a natural. You could you could pivot again uh, today. I could if I went. Well, in 2003, the ISP that bought the ISP that bought the ISP. I'll, I'll tell a. This is Chad uh, Gadya. It's a you know, it's like the thing that ate the thing that ate the thing that happens. Yep. We talk about it at Passover uh, in the Jewish yep. tradition. Um, you know, shut down, finally shut down shell services, and in 2003, 80 people were like Avi, you want to start Net Access again? Shell, I'm like you know, for five dollars a month, you could have a VPS, and that's better. It's like no, 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 no. It's better. It's curated. We can chat with each other. We can. Yep. You know, it's your problem when Emacs sucks all the memory. I'm like, no, no, no. Emacs is fast now. It's fine. It's fine. You uh, are we going to bring up VI now? <laughs> I use VI. Actually, <laughs> it's interesting because the network hipsters and the coding hipsters love Go and Python. But Go and Python are not well-tuned to my brain because I don't think white space should be syntax because of TCL, which means I don't like Python. And I don't think uppercase should be scope because like the beautiful C is all lowercase. But back in the days of Foxbase and Turbo C, I use it was IDE and I didn't mind. So I'm actually thinking maybe if I use an IDE, which ironically apparently VS code comes from you know uh, Visual Studio, then maybe I won't be typing all the syntax and maybe I, I I will like be able to get with it. But all I can write is you know like proof of running specification CEO code. So it doesn't really matter, you know, but we'll see. I said Q4, maybe, maybe, oh. maybe in Q4. So, Love it. so um, yeah, it reminds me of early in my ISP days because there was a while when I was the only ISP in Philly. Yep. <clears throat> a competing ISP would come from the BBS. So his first ISP was PC board with dial out to a terminal server to get to the internet. Um, said, Avi, it disturbs me that you're pricing at, I think we were 20 or 1250, I forget what we got to by that point. He's like, because he was, it was funny, exactly at 35. He's like, you need to raise your price to match mine. Well, I'll reduce my price and crush you. I'm like, so you're going to like drive everyone out of business and be $5 a month half the time and then then raise the price to 50 and then do it again? Like, I don't think that's the way the world is going. But I have to applaud you. You're pressing it starting... At lower, because I think we went 20, 12, 50, and then 10. It's so, like, you know. so I, I got to tell you, this is a thing now where um, we sell a, a gig, like a fiber gig for right. 90 bucks a month. Right. We have no, sh- you know, my, my problem is building networks and signing people and, and connecting people, not signing mm-hmm. people up. Right. And I'll say to investors, you know, look, we think long term there's downward pressure on price, right. and they'll they'll say to me, but but that's crazy. Why would that be the case? Uh, you know, I've read every cable analyst report, which says they're going to be able to raise the price by you know two to five percent a year for the next five years. Like, why would you not be able to, as well? 
And when I try and describe the inevitable sort of outcome of these markets, they just can't grok it. Like they just you feel like Cassandra. I, I well, <laughs> what? Except now it's I'm, not negative, you know. Yeah, for the I, I'm just old and crotchety. It's sort of like <laughs> I don't, you know. Yeah, whatever. You know, I'm just going to tell you what's going to happen. And, I have the rule of three now. I'll explain it three times, or ask three times, or offer to pay three times, and then I'm just like, okay, my time. You know, I don't want to annoy people. <laughs> if, they, if they don't agree, right. it's fine. Everyone can move on. Have, have a well, fun and life. in this case, it's a statement against interest, right? I mean, you know, obviously, investors would like it better if I was right. telling them we had pricing power. And mm-hmm. uh, um, but, but I do, you know, I still think we're going to see, you know, five years out when we have a settling in this market, um, you will see, you know, because we're in the middle of a reformation. You know, we we can talk yeah. about that whenever you like. Um, you will see that price of internet access start to come down. It's inevitable. Interesting. Okay. Even with, do you think that's related to, not related to, you know, the disaggregation of content, you know, and, and you know, from access on yeah, the cable? Totally, no, so, it, it, not related to. Okay. Um, it's it's one hundred percent a function of, and you know we're jumping to you know right. chapter eight in the story, right. but, and we can work back as you like. But just you know, go to the end. The end is a U.S. And by the way, it's a different story in every country in the world, and I can tell that country's story. I'll just okay. you know I, with the one I'm telling now <laughs> is, is the U.S. story. Um, you know, you 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 now have fiber everywhere. What you're going to have is a fiber product that is superior to a coax product. You're going to have a DSL product that won't matter. You're going to have things around the edges in the in the remote places where there's no fiber, Starlink. like yeah. Starlink and WIS. And in the vast majority of the country, I'd say 120 of 140 million homes, it will essentially be fiber, which will be a better service and coax, which will be an inferior service, the inferior service will have to charge less. And so then what you'll have is, you know, people who are willing to pay a premium for fiber. Again, that premium is going to be some number south of what they're paying today. Okay. And you'll have a coax product priced underneath that. You're a, and there'll be some new stasis, mm-hmm. you know, in market share there. You're a dangerous person. <clears throat> Uh, <laughs> I, I, it's just inevitable to me. Look, yeah. um, there's going to be, you know, I talked about 120 million homes being built. Right. If we can build 1 million of them, I've done an amazing job. Well, and you know, yeah. my, my wildest dreams are three, 4 million. Like, and, and, and by the way, I never before, you know, as the CEO of a public company, do I talk about my hopes and dreams in the context of fiber, I do because the numbers are so big. Right. That it's, you can do what you want with them. You know, here's my yeah. hopes and dreams. Yeah. And there can be a lot of diverse successes, you know, yep. uh, making it happen, which is cool. Absolutely. So, so we'll come back and then come forward. Yep. Networking. How did you how did you see it, find it, get interested? Well, I think for me, you know, I've always been uh, a business person first and a geek <laughs> second. Uh, uh, you know, I would let myself take one fun course every year in university. And, in, you know, my first year that was computer programming, which meant, you know, filling out punch cards with a pencil and putting them into a card reader. Um, and and then, uh, you know, getting in the ISP space, you naturally just have to learn about networking. So I think it's, it's deep osmosis. Um, where we are today, which is kind of interesting in this context, when we're trying to describe, um, you know, some of the success we've had, you know, we, we, we describe it in terms of being multilingual. You know, we can speak finance and speak ISP and networking and, uh, you know, speak sort of culture mm-hmm. and business. And, so. right. and it's really being able to understand natively, you know, each of those things that, and, and therefore the interrelationship, you know, it's, it's kind of like, if you're not bilingual, you'll just lose something in the translation between the things. People you know, don't. I'm sure you've had great frustrations in your <clears throat> life with finance people who just didn't understand networking, for instance. Yeah, it's it's uh, or at Akamai, you know, our CFO would would help torture, <laughs> you know, help help because well, I mean, he had a 
PhD in electrical engineering, uh, did, uh, you know, designed video games and, you know, but it's interesting because right. sometimes people look at me weirdly when I, when I say I business nerd or I finance nerd or they, people don't think of that as like a nerding thing, like oh, software, yeah. but it yeah. sort of is, oh, right? Okay. When we hire people, we don't necessarily care that they're yet a nerd about the thing they're going to work on. But if they can't nerd about something, you know, take a position, show that they're passionate, have paid attention to it. And it's yeah. sort of like the XKCD diagram, right? If you sit and wait for the received knowledge to come into your brain, it doesn't work. You need to be comfortable, comfortable with confusion. Like, I don't understand. I don't understand. I don't. Oh, and then the best is you teach because everyone else is confused. If you were confused, then probably the teaching needs to be better. I love that. Um, one of the things that's most important to me when I'm uh, interviewing people is just to try and figure out what the thing they love is. And I think way too often people conflate what they're good at with what they love. And, yeah, it's, you know, it's the, the what they love is that thing that they're going to do at the end of the day. You know, it's right. that thing they're going to do on the weekend because it's just super interesting. And, 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 and it's really, it's the intersection between those two things and what needs to get done you know, where the magic lies. And, yeah. and uh, so I think that's exactly right. I, I can't believe how fortunate I am that the things which I enjoy doing, you know, are, are valuable. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, um, that's, that's yeah. awesome. So, so coming forward, so CDN that wasn't marketed as a CDN or monetized as CDN um, domains, which came first? Um, Sell, you know, ting, yeah. or yeah. okay, yeah. that's what I thought. Yeah. So, so yeah. that's not IP. I guess there's IP in there, but like, so why don't you describe ting? And and I am curious. I haven't heard the whole origin story there. I just yeah. So that I mean, that's, up. that's Ting Mobile, which is now Mobile. a brand that's owned by Dish, and will likely come back mm-hmm. at some point. Then there's Ting, the ISP. So longer Ting Mobile, term, yeah. Ting will be the ISP. Just but. Okay. But Ting Mobile, when we launched in 2010, 11, um, you know, the, 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 this was just, uh, at its simplest, uh, taking the things we were really good at in the domain name space. So, um, you know, sort of, uh, 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 there was great customer service. There was a great billing and provisioning platform. Uh, there was a, an understanding of the value of um these simplified business processes. And so we looked at, um, you know, it would, but domains were too small. When I say too small, total addressable market that we could attack was tiny and I needed growth. So at the time, mobile phone service in the US was the single, it is still the single largest technology market in the world. Uh, ISP service in the US is number two. Um, wow, I didn't. I should have known well, that, because people don't think about them as technology, right? Like it's like they're <clears> in this <throat> weird bucket of telecom, but it's all tech. And anyway, the, um, <laughs> and and the net operating margins in that, you know, you want to kind of uh, business nerd a little. It were in the were in the like industry wide. We're in the high forties. Verizon was in the mid fifties. So there were clearly excess economic profits. It was ridiculous. US your margin is, is my your margin is my business. Absolutely. Your opportunity. And 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 and, and <clears throat> you know, the all I did was I, I you know I poked around and poked around until I could find somebody who could share with me what MVNO rates might look like. There were these things called MVNOs, mobile virtual network operators who could buy capacity from uh, the big telecoms. Um, at the time, we could easily sell for, you know, way more than we could buy uh-huh. while still being well under the market. And you had the provisioning technology that someone could be a $15 or $20 a month customer uh, without and make money, you know, Six. and support. I mean, the, the most profitable uh, accounts we had were the stick a phone in the drawer for somebody coming from out of town at six bucks a month. We just... You know, we we approached it as if we were customers and we kind of redesigned the service from the ground up. And there was a dirty little secret. There is a dirty little secret in telecom, which is over half of the customer service interactions are about billing. 
So if you just have simple billing, like, you know, it's not like Doc Searles calls it the confusatorium, right. which I love, you know, it's, yeah. you know, their business model was to screw you. It's mandated. Well, evenings it's and weekends, calling circles, <laughs> the way that roaming worked in market, out of market, in country, out of country, you know, the limits on things. And then if you go over those limits, you get punitively smacked about the head and face. So you overbuy your limits and just all of it, right? right. It was, and, 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 you know, we just eliminated all of that. And that was incredibly novel at the time and, um, uh, you know, quite profitable. We made good margins and good dollars right from the start. So did you have an eye towards Ting broader ISP or was it... So- what I would say is I always hung around the fiber crowd in the U S there was a lot of fellow travelers. It was really about time and place. What happened for us, you know, fiber is very expensive. Yes. You you need a lot of capital. Uh, Two or three years after we launched Ting mobile, it was the intersection between, I now had two businesses generating a shit ton of cash and, you know, didn't require any capital. And uh, the market was ripe enough in a lot of different ways that you could start to, to build fiber or start to do fiber. So we, we, didn't, we bought a business in 2014. We partnered with a small uh, uh, city in Maryland in 2015. And we started building our first network in October of 16. Um, and it was just, you know, Avi, if you want to, which you'll appreciate sort of, the sort of the thinking and bets element of this. This was like, you know, we we had a set of core premises. And if you ran the numbers, it was like, this is crazy profitable. I'm not sure it can really be this good. And everybody else thinks we're crazy. Right. So, you know what? It's a good combination. I'll I'll push (laughs) a few chips in the pot. Let me test my premises. Let me push a few more in. Let me test my premises further okay, this looks good. You know, let's start to really push some money in. Well, it's funny because Google, I always viewed sort of, you know, fiber and loon and stuff like that. It's, it's unfair someone isn't able to you know, click on our ads. Like it's unfair. We must make it so everyone can click on our ads, but you're coming at it from a different oh, yeah. perspective. So yeah. is it, so it, So it's. it's not altruistic. People need better. It's. Uh, it's that plus we can... And you have the back end technology, which I probably would rather pull fingernails out than work on building systems all the time. But so, yeah, yeah. No. So, so it, it, that's right. I mean, the, the very first thing, the story I tell, you know, I walked into the first ISP I worked at. This is late '94, early '95. I I come in. The day starts with two women going to a filing cabinet. One starts at one end. One starts at the other end, and they're pulling contracts. And I said, "What's going on? Like, what are you guys doing?" Oh, we, we, we go through all the customers. You know, I started A, she starts at Z. Oh, my God. Not and, to see and, when and we look expiring. See, right, right. We wish to see, like, who, whose day of the month is this? And then we build them. So I'm like, this can't be. So I wrote, uh, you know, a piece of billing software. Thankfully, that was, you know, rewritten by somebody else, you know, six or 12 months later. But but it's exactly that, you know. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I had it uh, in the interstitial before Kentech when I was at Akamai. But um, I was really thought we should do cloud, but they didn't want me to, but they didn't want me to leave. So I, I bought, I had a Usenet company, which I, I still dabble in Usenet. So I bought a Usenet company and I'm looking for the billing system. And I'm like, but I know that things are built. And it was all in Windows, which was not my jam. Yeah. And it turns out there was no billing system. It was recurring with PayPal and um, and their credit card processor. And what happened, what would happen is emails came in and the owner's former former owner's wife would go in and manually set the thing. And so after a week, I'm like, wait. And I wrote a proc mail to like do the thing based on the end. <laughs> and she's like, I have to go like kill my husband because I did this for eight years. Oh. I like manually went through. I looked at the emails and set the uh, users because, you know, great programmers are lazy. Yeah. So right? I, the- what's true is... It's impossible to deliver a good customer experience, a good web experience, if you don't have 
you know, sort of a, a, a solid back-end billing and provisioning system integrated with customer care, uh, managing data in motion, you know, really, um, and the things you can do today with modern software, it's, it's so I, I think there's a whole revolution there. I talk about it as, you know, if we build, there's going to be 70 million homes built in the U.S. fiber in the next uh, five years. If we can build a million, we've done amazing. If we can build three million, we've fulfilled my dreams. I want to sell software to the other 67 million. Well, that was going to be my question. I know you're yeah. a public company CEO, so you can't, you know, have to be careful of projections. If you wave your magic wand for 10 yeah. years from now, is that where you'd like to be? You'd like to have single high mid mid high mid single digit millions and be fulfilling and and helping the growth of the rest. Uh, I think that's fair. I think that you know I, I I my you know first love will always be the ISP business. Uh, I think you know I'll be um, that business is still luckily anachronistic enough. Yeah. That I'm pretty fresh and current. Yes. <laughs> and, uh, whereas, you know, when it comes to software, there are other, when it comes to software, when it comes to data, when it comes to a few other elements, you know, I, I keep myself well read, but I am not an expert by mm -hmm. any stretch anymore. And, um, you know, so there, I think, you, you, you know, over time, I'll play a little bit less and less of a role. The other is more native to me. Interesting. So, you, you know, it's interesting. One of the things you just said, if I could go back in time, I would have bootstrapped Kentic for probably another year. And in the SaaS business, software business, there's a move called product-led growth, where, where it's not just about shooting flaming balls of marketing money in the air. It's, it's about being understandable. Um, so we have a learning center we're doing. And, and, and even just the, you know, when you start and you have people wanting functionality, the billing support, you know, uh, there's enough money in the venture market <clears throat> that if you get, if you start getting high growth, you say, okay, well, we'll have some people do that. And with, yeah. with, with apologies to some of our own customer success people. Um, now I will say at Kentic, it wasn't really user visible, but if I could go back and do it again, those foundational, how do we make it super simple? Yeah because there's real understanding that that breeds virality, yeah. which is the yeah. cheapest kind. It's exponential mark. Well, I guess we saw that with Ting, but, you know, the virality. Well, I mean, the, with OpenSRS first. I, well, I shouldn't even say that. With I mean, with the software, with the download business first. Yeah. But with OpenSRS, I mean, we went to an ISP con in November of 1999. You know, it was all about content and mirrors and software downloads. There was a little bit at the edge of the booth. You know, yeah, we're doing this domain name thing. 700 signed contracts at the show. Wow. Like, you know, I mean, so yes, that virality is, I mean, I, I think I just suck as a marketer. And so, you know, let me just try and grab a baton and get in front of the virality parade. One of the things that I'm wrestling with in telecom, well, that we think we're going to do, no, sorry, we're going to do, we don't know if it's going to be successful or not. Okay. Uh, um, is... You know, we don't think anybody has ever built or sold to the geeks in telecom. And you get inside of these big telecoms, and they've got some good geeks. They really oh, do. Absolutely. <clears throat> and 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 um, you know, but you're everything there is sold to the CIO. So this is going to be the first real effort of you know, as you've described, doing that kind of you know really developer focused, you know, telecom developer focused platform. That's and. Uh, Product-led you know, growth. Uh, it is. Uh, it's but, Twilio. Ask your developer. But, right? It's, it, it's, it's Twilio, exactly. It's <clears throat> Mongo. It's a million of them. Slack. But, but right. the, 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 the thing that I don't know is, you know, can developers kind of jump the blood-brain barrier to the CIO to actually, because it's still the CIO who's got the budget. It's mm -hmm. still the CIO who has to write the check, <clears throat> et cetera. So, you know, it'll be, uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, yes, I will. I will. We'll have you on in a couple of years, and we'll we'll hear how yeah. it's going. Yeah, that that would be about right <clears throat> too. But we are thinking a ton about exactly that. You know how to uh, build it for them. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Um. So, OpenView Labs 
OpenView in Boston and um, actually Georgian partners in Canada write a lot about product-led growth. And it's funny because they really are, are more focused on bottoms up. But I think that, for example, even if you have a complex enterprise sales process, reducing the number of SE meetings by making onboarding easy gives business value. So traditional product-led growth is more like start $50 a month or, or $6 a month in your case, and then mine the big end as you grow. But a lot of those principles, I think, apply and it's demystify and it's understand. And so I think, you know, it's it's an interesting area. It's like, yeah. it can be Talmudic when when you don't have to agree, but even the discussion is interesting. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, there's a, I call him the great Lemkoni. Jason Lemkin is a, is a VC and writes about SaaS and, and was one of the first to help me realize, like, whether you're doing legal SaaS, telco billing SaaS, network SaaS, um, but he's very repetitive. But one of the things he's repetitive about is saying as CEO, as you know, you need to be repetitive and say the same thing. So even when I disagree with him, it's an interest. it would be, yeah. we don't talk, we've talked a couple of times, be an interesting discussion, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Always hire two salespeople because it, without, if you hire one for any role, you can't compare, you know, it's like, well, you can't always do that. You know, yeah. how do you support VPs? Like there's just lots of interesting conversation there. Yeah. So. yeah. Yeah. See, um, I, I I I feel now like I've been uh, I, I I can go and get a map somewhere. We should talk more. We should talk more. I'm, yeah, I'm just wandering around <laughs> in the wilderness. That's, that's right. So you talk about you got into it through business. I love the business side. Yeah. But my ADD kicks in when it comes to policy. Whoa. Is policy fascinating? Is it something you need to do? Like what? Because you know politics yeah. and policy. And that's a great that. question. So. Um, you know, for me, I was an abject failure until I was in my mid-30s and the internet, you know, came along. And I loved the online world from the second I touched it, which would have been kind of late 80s. And, you know, so I've always felt like I owed a debt to the internet. Let me say it like that. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also always been clear to me when I say that, in the sense that, you know, it's always so easy to sort of, to know what's going to happen eventually, but, you know, I have no idea when. Mm-hmm. You know, it's always more important. To, Visionary, yeah. Yeah, like to just, you know, the, too many people are just like, it's great, I can tell you what's going to happen in 10 years, now pay me some money. Uh, no, you know, it doesn't work like that. And it's been, it was clear to me from the onset that the effects of the internet were, be, would, were to pull from national to global up and from national to local down. Mm. So it allowed you to do stuff at a local level that you could not, you know, you needed more scale for previously. Huh? And that, I mean, you know, I'll sometimes, you, I've used a bunch of different, you know, kind of taglines for this, but I have much more in common with a Iranian blogger than with a U.S. or Canadian statist. Um, and, and so it's kind of, who's your community, who's your tribe. Mm -hmm. And it's clear to me also that, you know, democracy is sclerotic at this point and deeply ineffective. And so it's, you know, just the, you, you kind of combine all those things and what you have is something else is coming. Mm. Right. I, 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 you know, I, I, anybody who says they know what that is, you know, we're now on a, you know, on a decades kind of time scale. Mm -hmm. But I feel like the stuff we're seeing, you know, I've spent a lot of time in ICANN, which is where most people who kind of right. connect me with policy think about that. You know, and I've been around since the beginning, again, just because we happen to be right. in the registrar space. It was regulated. But what it is, is it is, I, you know, I use big lofty phrases like it's a progenitor of global governance, you know, and, and, and by that I mean the countries of the world have, have, have a torn ownership of a piece of, of, of policy, you know, governing the single authoritative, authoritative route, which is the one bit of centralization, tiny kernel that everything else in the open internet is built on. And so I just think there's so much, like, I, I feel like um, what, you know, we're in the middle ages Democracy is inevitable, you know, or monarchy, mm-hmm. the collapse of monarchy and empire is inevitable. 
And it's like, you know, I, I get to kind of be part of the very proto, very early um, uh, thinking. And, and that's just so compelling intellectually. So like, would it be accurate to say sort of the ability to be part of that and where it's going uh, helps assuage the uh, short-term uh, talking in circles and talking about how to talk about talking about talking about things and committees yeah, and all that. Yeah, look, I can't... I can't um, do that. I can't. I, I can't know. I, I, my, and my capacity over time has reduced, and I try and sit above it more <clears throat> and more, and just lob in bombs and, okay. you know, really just try and sort of the disruptor the thing. <laughs> yes, you know, in a slightly different direction, or you know, make a different kind of black mm -hmm. hole or magnetic force. Um, uh, you know, we'll be we'll be we'll be doing some stuff in a couple of weeks around content. Like I can give you a simple example of this. It's, you know, think of, think of, I mean, you, you have a deep appreciation of the fact that cybercrime today is just completely asymmetrical. Mm -hmm. And it's asymmetrical primarily because you can't solve global problems using national frames. It, it, it's just, you know, you can, I, I can, I can do a long version of that. I, I won't for time, but, you know, it, it, it's, the problem is these, these national things. Frame. And so, you know, we all know where the bad guys are. So often, I mean, I, I had to spend well over a decade, you know, sort of dealing with my frustration around somebody doing something terrible, knowing exactly who they are and where they were. And you can't do anything about it. No, it's not legal to fight. It's not legal. I mean, you can't BG, BG, BGP hijack back someone because then you'd be committing right. a crime. Right. And so, so <clears throat> all the frames are wrong. And so... Um, you know, we're going to try and do some stuff in the next little bit dealing with really easy, low-hanging fruit, fishing, farming, the, when I say the worst elements of spam. But there's the so many that right. are virulent, right? Yes. Uh, your uh, Avi, thank you. We've processed your Norton antivirus and it's, and it's a cat and mouse game. And we can stop all of that at the level of the DNS. And, and, and so that's going to become something you know, that I'm going to... Uh, Interesting, because uh, Spam House effectively nice. does that, you know, with reputation and whatever. It just but, They don't, you know. they, they do, when you said effectively, you used it in the sense of... Uh, oh, uh, not globally, but they're effective by not being sort of, you know, by not being, by being hard to sue, by saying it's not us, the ISPs choose to do what we, you know, to, to use this. Uh, they solve a piece of it, I guess. But inside of ICANN, some of this stuff can be formalized and should. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. And so, and so, um, you know, that's going to be. But it, all of that is just an example of. Okay, cool. Here's this really low hanging fruit problem around cybercrime. Mm -hmm. Now, it, maybe if we can just solve it in this one place where I can be part of it. Maybe that'll inspire other people to take on, you know, bigger and broader, and you know. And I mean, it's amazing to me. Look, we still live in a world, you know, let's talk about NSO. Yep. Right? We still live in a world <laughs> where there are these parallel universes between statecraft and crime. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, until we all recognize that just because a state does something that's criminal, that doesn't make it right. I still do have to be thankful that the criminals don't want to shit where they eat because the internet infrastructure itself is still very fragile. Yep. And so whether it's, whether it's, you know, whoever it is at whatever level, um, you know, I'm glad they're not attacking the internet infrastructure because, or, you know, because, because there are ways to do that, that we uh, know, so, but don't want yeah. to do. Well, and I would say that's true today, right? I could uh, lay out a set of facts for you where some threat actors that might not be true for it. Right. Okay. And, 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 and so, you know, I think that, that we've got to find a way to globally combat some of this stuff or, you know, okay. every, we'll, we'll do a, shit. we'll do a, a separate dedicated on this because I'm fascinated, but <clears throat> um, I'll just say that, you know, I was on the RNAC advisory council from when it first, yep. it became clear to me that I liked hanging out with my friends and I applaud all my friends and, and non-friends yep. that are on it. I think the th the breaking point for me was when like people aren't deploying IPv6 because it's too hard to get. I was like, 
No, that's not the problem. And then Jim Fleming and IPv8 and jumping through a wormhole and peering with Uranus. And I was just like, no, it's too much. I can't deal with this. And, you know, to see John Curran, you know, do so well, uh, you know, as as super legal dude, but, but you know, and handle and the patience. And then I actually, Paul Toomey was working with us at Akamai to do consulting and stuff. And he called me, you know, he's like, I'm going to be, uh, they, you know, uh, they're interested in, you know, CEO of ICANN. It's like, oh my God, I think I'd rather clean high rise windows with my tongue and no ropes or something. I mean, I just, I would, <laughs> my, again, my ADD. So well, I guess no, I'm not it, power it, hungry it, enough or patient enough. No, it's, 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 or altruistic enough and visionary these, enough. Sadly, <laughs> uh, again, like politics, which is the reason that democracy is so sclerotic and ineffective right now. Um, and that's, by the way, not me saying, so therefore, you know, dictatorship at all. I, I, you know, there's a longer discussion. Uh, but there are certain people who, you know, can just engage in intellectual masturbation and the system rewards it, you know, or, or engage in sort of the, the levers of power for yeah. power's sake. Uh, we'll be careful about politics, but I also think you want to have some friction in the system. And part of the problem hmm. in the U.S., so I describe this as it was like the fighting of the last war. Like, why is the U.S. in generally speaking globally terrible shape? You know, 2016, China connected more homes to fiber than our homes in the U.S. On the infrastructure side, right. right. Yeah. And, and, and the reason is because the infrastructure that people were delivering internet on was cable. So it felt like entertainment. And then you had a whole swath of big companies, big telecom, big media, who wanted to see it as entertainment, right? That that was its primary purpose. And so it was not appreciated as infrastructure. The whole regulatory framework is that which is amenable to entertainment, not heat, water, you know, power. Or all the way over to human rights. Yeah, like like those things. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't think you need to get to human right. Like, great, you know, do what? I, it's just what you get into semantic issue, but, right? But I do clearly think it's right. well in right. the after times, right? In the before times, we could argue about it. In the after times of COVID, or which hopefully we'll get to soon, but <clears throat> um, or or after ish, yes. um, you know, it's critically, it's clearly required, and if you don't yeah. have enough bandwidth to educate your children and do your work. You're gonna, you know, you're gonna have problems. So, if, um, if you knew some of the data in the U.S., I mean, you may, but you know, I would expect you don't. It's, it's, it's unbelievable, and it's, it's the intersection of a whole bunch of historical problems. That you know, if there's one thing at a policy level on that side of the business that I am desperately hoping for, is as much money as possible to go to subsidy. And as little money as possible. Not like like just if you've got, you know, this is your ball, how right. should the ball be split? Well, there's hundreds of millions, I think, as part of this or, or billions well, there's, as there's, part of the infrastructure. It, bill. It's still a small <laughs> percentage of the total. Right. And, and and what people don't get is you build a network for one or two years, you operate it for a hundred. And and so and in and in one case, you're subsidizing companies, and in the other, you're subsidizing people. And and it's just you know, uh, oh I see. So sort of like, although I could take the counter like the what was it called the ISP subsidy the, the educational subsidy. Um, it, it, I think it launched in the nineties. There was something uh, great. Um, yeah, E rate. E rate. Yeah. Um, that was that was also subsidizing the buy side, not the sell side, and yep. but in aggregate, it effectively was subsidizing the sell side. There was a yeah. little bit of choice. Yes. But it was, I, would, I would say that's true about E-rate. And I don't question, look, uh, I will get higher penetration rates the higher that subsidy. There's no right. question. But, mm-hmm. but the reason that I'll get higher penetration rates is because somebody won't have to rely on this for their right. home internet access. Mm-hmm. And, and this won't be the screen that they consume it on. Right. And it won't be the bandwidth limitations they experience. Got it. So, uh, like, I, yes, that is true, but it's kind of a second or even a third order effect. You know, there's just, there's just um, uh, uh, you know, such a 
a problem to address on, on a number of levels. But you know what? <laughs> All the momentum now is so positive and so inevitable. Yeah, no, it's it's encouraging. Yeah. So I think we have a lot to talk about on a second show at some point, but I'll end with a couple questions. Yes. High level answer to this one, because I'm sure this is very deep. I was really impressed when I went to the website, which I hadn't been to for a while, and saw yeah. you feature, you ask people, go to Glassdoor, check us out, yeah. um, and you know, feature Glassdoor reviews. Like, what is it you know, um, that has worked well for you at, at Two Cows that I guess you're, you know, seems to make people happy? Culture is always in the little things. Um, it is the things you do when no one's looking. Um, so I, I really, it's amazing to me that people, you know, it's just all golden rule mm -hmm. and that people complicate it beyond that. Mm. If you just do what you feel is right, I, I'm sure that there are network geeks who love working for you more than, you know, anybody else they've worked for. And the simple reason is probably going to be that you're treating them how you would want to be treated. You know, you're do you're, you know, it's going to be the the person who didn't do this for you, and you're going to do it for them, mm -hmm. and 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 that's all. And then you just sort of, you know, the only other sort of big bucket there is filtering. You know, I think that there are certain people who will, for whom we will be the best work experience they'll ever have in their life, and then there are other people whom really it won't matter that much to. So mm -hmm. you know, the more money driven you are probably not going to do as well here. Mm -hmm. The more status driven you are, probably not going to do as well here. The more um, uh, uh, kind of you're, you're looking to be upwardly mobile. You know, I want to see, I want a new job title every 18 months or 24 mm -hmm. months. You know, people sit at the same job title sometimes at Two Cows for eight, 10 years. Their job, their responsibilities increase every year. Their, their, their scope and scale increases every year. But, you know, it looks like they've right. been in the same, same thing at the same title for eight years. Um, uh, you know, do you love the internet? Yep. And, and, and it's kind of those filters. And I'm unhesitating. Um, and, and I think that trickles down through the ranks of just, yeah, okay, you know, I'm not going to chase this person. This is not a fit. Right. No, that makes sense. And you have to, in order to give great support, you need to have great people that are happy <laughs> oh, in their like job. Our fights are on the reverse, right? You know, I'll give you one that you'll love. Um, you know, we originally, we let people pick their own router. You know, it's like, we're not wow. going to, you know, because that's a nice thing yeah. to do. But there are enough people that pick some the cheapest router. And then it's like, well, why didn't I get a gig? Because you got a hundred right. Port on the back of the thing. Right. Like, you know, it's not like I'm ripping you off. <clears throat> um, and, and so as we try to push in better communication, if you're going to own your own router, <clears throat> our customer service people were resistant to that. It's like, wow. but, but this is our values. This is what we do. Like, how can you restrict them? Right. And so I love that. Right. When we, you're, we had that tension, you, know, we had lonely people that would call it support and we had to say two hours a week. Like we actually said, like, <laughs> we feel bad for them. If they just want to talk to support uh, two hours a week. Yeah, um, and uh, yeah. So I guess last question. Um, sounds like you've been having fun and mm -hmm. thank you for all the impact you've had and options you've given people. Mm -hmm. Any career advice you'd give your younger self? Well, uh, I think I'll repeat two things that I tell my children. Okay. One, make sure you do what you love. That was important for me growing up. But in today's hyper-competitive world, I just have to compete with people in Toronto or maybe Ontario. You know, you're competing with people from all over the world. If you don't love what you do, you won't work hard. If you don't work hard, you won't succeed. Full stop. Second, you know, there's a story I tell. My daughter hates when I tell it like this. Um, Dad, I'm, you know, I'm starting my first real job. Uh, how do I know, you know, I don't want people to hate me. How can I make sure people <laughs> like me? And I said, you know, this is really simple. If you make the people who you work with and work around you, if you make their jobs easier, they're going to like you, no matter how big a bitch you are. And if you make their jobs harder, they're going to dislike you, no matter how kind and sweet you are. Real simple. So. Okay. Well, that's uh, good lessons. Um, well, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Uh, I look forward to a part two. I think we have plenty of things to continue. Yeah. And best of luck with uh, two cows and um, and the grand uh, ISP dream. Yes, more soon, more soon. I enjoyed myself. Thanks.